Being from California, uh, I've lived in the southern part of the state uh, for the first part of my life and then the la- north part of the state for the whole last 20 years before I moved here 10 years ago. So I know the state pretty well. Uh, my roommate, one of my roommates in college was from uh, the Oroville uh, area. So last year I was kind of interested to see like what was happening when the Oroville Dam filled up with uh, more rainwater than it had ever experienced before. Because uh, they built it like for worst case scenario and if you get the 50 year like rain, the dam might you know, not make it. Uh, did you watch the news last year, you remember? It's, I think it's like the second biggest earthen dam in the United States. Uh, and it, it was compromised, the water, they, had, they got their 50 year you know, rain and water was everywhere and the dam filled up and it was spilling over the, uh, the top of it and going down the spillway and drilling a 250 foot wide hole at the base of an earthen dam, which is not really optimal. Uh, spilling over, I think, the western bank of the dam and coming down a, a dirt gully, forming gullies down the dam. Again, that's not optimal for an earthen dam. Uh, and so they were you know, theorizing people downstream were going to get flooded. And so they, they evacuated 200,000 people. It was amazing watching what was going on there because I, I know the region. What I find really interesting is the um, state of California has, has a few environmentalists that live in it. God love them. Uh, and I'm, I live there 50 years. I understand their mindset. And I'm all for, you know, taking care of things. And uh, they were really concerned about that dam. For 12 straight years, they told uh, uh, the governor uh, and his people, from our perspective, if you don't thro- start throwing some money at that dam, it could be compromised if there's ever a big rain. For 12 years, they blew them off. And they, in the last year when they got the big rain, before they got the big rain, uh, the governor decided to spend a, a ton of the state monies on the supposedly much needed uh, fast rail transit system between San Francisco and LA. And I'm thinking, they've got two major systems of freeways, I-5 and 99. What do they need a railway for? But that's where all the money went. They didn't pour it into the dam. What happened? Well, worst case scenario happened. Uh, and they almost flooded like, you know, half of Northern California with that dam. It didn't blow. They were able to save it. But I'm looking at that from a spiritual perspective, shouldn't you? That's how I read the news. <laughs> at this point, I've been here 10 years trying to train you how to watch the news. And I'm, I'm watching the news going, oh, yeah, I totally understand that. Because it's, it's like a metaphor of life. Because the, the Christian is like the environmentalist. You probably never looked at yourself this way. But you're a spiritual environmentalist. So what are you saying? That God has put a protective dam to protect societies. It's called morals. Moral reality. It's built into the warp and woof of the culture. So therefore, if you live contrary to moral, moral reality, and you live contrary to the fact that there is a living God that you're supposed to worship with your life, and you choose to do anything contrary to that, a deviation, abnormal, it creates an issue with the dam. There's a crack. And there's another crack, and there's a whole bunch of cracks, and eventually water starts seeping out. Next thing you know, you have a huge issue. What should the Christian do as you're standing there watching the dam being compromised? You sit off to the side and go, that is so unfortunate. That whole dam's going, and when the dam goes, the culture's gone. Or should you be like R.C. Sproul? Here's what R.C. said. He just went home recently to be with the Lord. I have his uh, final uh, letter that he wrote to uh, those people who supported him. It's very interesting to read. He wrote it before he died, and... Very interesting reading. Here's what he said. We'll think of R.C. as a, he's an environmentalist of a spiritual perspective. He says, when man will not have God in his thoughts, what happens? Well, that lack immediately is reflected in what man does. If we think that God is not worthy of consideration, then that view will have major influence on our thoughts and on your lifestyle. It's pretty simple. He's right on the money. If I will not worship God, I will take him off the throne and I'm going to put something else on that throne and it's going to be subpar, subprime, abnormal, not natural. It's going to be something else I'm going to worship. And, and, and God's going to look at me and, and look at me and call me to the gospel. But I'm going to pursue my own ways. See, this is like the dam being compromised. If you look at chapter one of the book of Romans, Paul is writing to the Roman church and he's telling them, I'd love to come to your church. If I come, here are my credentials and I am going to talk about the gospel of Christ. It has bad news and good news. He said, I'll start with the good news first. Remember, this is review. Verse 16. He says, if I come there, I'm not ashamed to talk about what? You have a Bible? What's he say? The gospel. I'm not ashamed to talk about it. Well, I mean, Paul, you know, if you talk about it, you know, you're going to make people uncomfortable and people aren't going to like what you're going to have to say because it's so absolutist. You're saying there's only one way to God. Not many. Yeah, yeah, there is only one way to God. I'm going to talk about the gospel and it's the power of God to take a sinner and transform them. 
Because there was a Lord. He did come to the earth. He did die for our sins. He was resurrected. He's the Savior. I will talk about him. He can save sinners. The bad news is he's going to judge sinners. And the bad news is he's built into the cosmos the reality of his existence, and they push back against that because they don't want God. They want sin. So this is what he's going to talk about in uh, verses 17 and following. And this is the erosion in the earth and dam of the moral uh, protection God's built into the cosmos. If you begin to uh, buy into false philosophies, as he says, if they will not believe the God uh, who's put into the cosmo cosmology of the planet that he's there, they are going to develop their own philosophies. Did you go to college? Did you take philosophy? Did you stay awake? I remember my first philosophy class. I walked in. I'm probably 18 years old. The professor said, and I didn't tell this in the other services. This is extra. You could tell them they should have come to this service. Because I think of stuff as I'm going along. He, I walk in. He's sitting on his desk like, uh, like Indian style. And he's staring up at the ceiling. We're new students. We're walking and we're all excited. He's having a metaphysical moment. Hello. That's how I started out in philosophy. You know, this, if you want to have God, you'll have philosophies like what? What did you study? You didn't go to college? You just said you did. Oh, you don't remember college? It was in the 60s? <laughs> yeah. Existentialism. That was it? Kierkegaardianism, hedonism, pragmatism. You know what I mean? I mean, all that stuff. Did that work for you? No, because I studied that. That wasn't self-fulfilling, so I went to another one. Was that helpful? Well, to a point, but not really. So I went to another one. There's one and Paul said, this is what happens. You reject God. You buy into false thinking. That's what he says. That's a crack in the, in the dam. And he says, if you continue to, re to reject God, uh, you're going to follow not only your own desire to create false systems of belief to protect you from divine belief, you're going to take sexuality that God has given to you. It's a wonderful gift how he made it, men and women. And you're going to take that thing that you think about all the time and you're going to pervert it and you're going to call it pure. That's what he talks about. This is not Marty, this is Paul. He says, you're going to take those desires and follow them and as we've said, there's good desires and bad desires. It all depends on the object. So I've been married. My wife's uh, one of the counters for the offering, so she's not sitting there. I've been married 38 years this May. And my desire and passion is for her. She's my object. If I tell you I have desire and passion for her, and also that guy's wife and that guy's wife, and that, you're going to say what? Uh, what's the number for the elder board? <laughs> right? We need to talk to them. Right. Because there's good desire, bad desire. Are we Right. And so Paul's saying, if you have bad desire, wrong sexual object, sin. It's sin. Get back to what God says is true. How do you get down that road to abnormality? You reject God and his standards, and you want to be the standard. Because his are puritanical and too restrictive. So if you head down that road, Paul says that road is costly. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The rejection of divine revelation, built into the moral fabric of the cosmos, built into the cosmos itself, if you reject it, it's costly. Number one, this is review. It leads to sexual dishonor, not honor. This man's a sexual being. What's he do? He take. well, I don't want to believe in God, but boy, I like my desires. I fulfill my desires that are twisted from what God says. Ipso facto, they dishonor me. What's our culture say? Choose any kind of lifestyle that you want. Don't judge anybody else's lifestyle. And all lifestyles are created equal. True or not? No, Paul says that's false. One is honorable. There's a whole bunch that are dishonorable. And then he's going to say, what happens, secondly, if you reject a God and the moral structure of the world he's made? It leads not just to dishonor of your body and shame. It leads to sexual delusion. Delusion. Because this is how it works. If, you, if you're off two degrees with a compass reading and you head 10 miles, you didn't hit the target, right? If you walk 1,000 miles, you're really off. He said, if you start out de rejecting God and it's slightly twisted, well, I was just into a little pornography. Well, then it was a whole lot. And then it was a whole bunch. And then it led to this kind of relationship and that kind of relationship. This is not an upward spiral. It leads to delusion to where you delude yourself to thinking this is normal. What God wants is abnormal. And how dare anybody tell me that my lifestyle is not okay. Paul says it leads to delusion. Notice what he says, verse 25. He says, those who reject God, they exchange the truth of God that he exists for what? A lie. They concoct their own lie, and they will defend it to the death. They create their own lie, and they worship and serve who? Christian, your only other option. If I don't want to worship God, I'm going to serve myself. So I'll either serve my philosophical system, whatever that is, or I'll serve my desires, whatever they may be. 
They will worship the creature rather than the creator. And then he stops and says, the creator's blessed forevermore. Amen. I want to I look at this. We didn't really get into this last week. There's a lot here. When he says they changed the truth of God for a lie. Uh, in the original text of the New Testament, the Greek, uh, when I was reading it this week, I was really kind of interested to see that before the word lie is the word the. It's an article. How does that read? Does that have an article or not? An article is the word the. Before the word lie. What do we have? A. A, a means it's indefinite. So if you were to say, Paul, what kind of lie were you talking about? Well, you know, a lie, any kind of lie. No. In the Greek text, it's the lie. That's, that's totally different. The only place, and if you were studying this, the hermeneutic Bible study question you would want to ask yourself is simply this. What is the lie they buy into? Where else in the Bible is that construction, that phrase used? Only three places total. One here, one in the Old Testament, and another one in the New Testament. I'm talking about the word, the lie. If people won't follow God, what's the lie? Uh, Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28. If you're in a small group, great passage to read, to analyze. How does a Christian function in a godless, ever-declining culture? This is Isaiah. He's eventually going to be put into a log, and the log is sawn in two because they're tired of hearing his moral, spiritual voice in a culture wanting to do whatever they want to do. And so he tells, the, he castigates them with fault, their false tr- teaching in chapter 28. He addresses the northern tribes of Israel, the ten tribes, and he tells them, you know, you guys are going to be judged by God for the priest won't teach truth, the politicians won't live truth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. God's going to judge you. And then he tells the tribes of Judah, you're emulating what they're doing. Let's think about this. Why should I as a Christian stand up for morality and truth? Because sin is contagious. It's contagious. If you deviate here, that deviation will be taught to other people, and it's contagious. So notice what he says in verse 13 as he gets to the concept of a lie. He says to the, the Israelites that are about to watch their culture go off the cliff, he says, so the word of the Lord that you're hearing from me, the prophet, to them will be, quote, order on order, order on order, line up on line, line up on line, a little here, a little there, unquote. What's he talking about? I, I have heard that wrongly exegeted many times to say, oh, he's talking about Bible study methods. Have you heard this? Like, how are you supposed to study the Bible? Well, you know, a little here, a little there, line up on line, precept on precept, blah, blah, blah. Uh, That is not what he's talking about. He's talking about divine judgment. He's talking about the words his culture used to mock him. What they're doing there is they're telling him, uh, Isaiah, we are so tired of your narrow-minded, unloving, absolutist positions on God and morality. It's just a droning voice like a father talking to a son. I mean, are you a high school student? You ask your dad for the car and you get the 50 rules, don't you? (laughs) Don't park by anybody. I hate door dings. Don't break the speed limit. Look over your shoulder when you're changing lanes. Use your horn a lot. You're in Washington. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Now, on and on and on. You tell your friends, this is my dad. You, did you get the car? Yeah, I got the car. I got the 50 things. Droning on and on. And after a while, you just don't listen to him. And he's saying, this is how you're talking to me, the prophet of God. Is that You're just kind of telling me I'm droning on and on. Here's how it sounds in Hebrew. This is them mocking him. He, this is what they're saying he sounds like to them. And it, notice how it sounds very similar. Sav la sav, sav la sav. Kav la kav, kav la kav, sier sham, sier sham. That's all we hear from you. Isaiah, I mean, move on. The culture's moved on and left you behind. You're just droning on the same old, move on. Do you think that our culture does not mock the Christian anymore? No, absolutely they do. Just stand up for moral truth and what will they do? The same thing they did to him. Shav la shav, shav la shav. You guys need to move on. Isaiah says, no, I can't move on. Truth's at stake. Now, notice what he says in verse 4 about the lie. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. What's he call them? Oh, we're not there yet. Here's the Hey, what's he call them? He called them a name. So insensitive. What do you call them? They're a scoffer. They are. They're mocking the prophet of God. He says, uh, let me give you a word, scoffers, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, I'm going to quote your argument, he says, we have made a covenant with death. Uh, and with Sheol, that's the grave in the Old Testament. And we've made a pact with death, the underworld. The, the overwhelming scourge that you're talking about, Isaiah, all this negativity from God, 
Judgment for our sin will not reach us. Uh, It will pass us by. For we have made the faulted our refuge. And we have concealed ourselves with deception. At least they're honest. They say, hey, we we don't want God in our nation. And we definitely don't like what you're talking about. So we're going to embrace the lie. What's the lie? It's the Ugaritic pantheon. It's the God of the underworld. It's Thanatos. It's death. They say, we're going to make a pact with the devil himself. That's how much we don't want God in our lives. Because once God's in our lives, he'll dictate that we have to live differently and we don't want to. What's he tell them? You're going to pay for rejecting the living God. What was the lie? Reject God. You'll believe any lie down to the worshiping of the devil himself. Paul uses this concept of a lie in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. The lie, only other place in the Bible that the word the lie appears. Notice what he says here. He says, uh, and for this reason, he's talking about the end times, the tribulation, seven-year tribulation before Christ returns. For this reason, God will send upon them at that time a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false or the lie. In order that they might all be judged who did not believe the truth, but they took, notice what he says, pleasure in wickedness. Is sin fun? Oh, no, no, never. Why do people do it? Now you're getting all quiet. Why? You don't, there's no sinners here. Why, why do you break the speed limit? Oh, that's too personal. Sorry. Uh, people sin because it's pleasurable. It's just the bitter taste afterwards that you realize I shouldn't have done that. See, he says at the end of time, God is going to send a delusion for those who reject him. And because they find sin pleasurable and righteousness not, he will send them a delusion to believe the lie. What's the lie? The lie is the Antichrist, the antithesis of Jesus. Because Jesus was laws, rules, regulations, etc. of holiness, narrowness of how to reach God. No, they don't want, they want the ultimate man. They'll, they'll believe that lie. And God says, you want to live that way? I'll turn you over to that. What's Paul saying when he's talking about the lie? He's talking about the propensity to push God off the throne and put even the Antichrist on the throne. Anything but God. Man's ways are better than God's ways. Your desires are better than God's desires. Back in Genesis, and this all relates to Genesis because the concept of the lie originates in Genesis, not one, not two, not four, Three. You guys are cheating. It's in chapter three. Remember? That's where the lie came in. Remember the devil? What was the lie that he proposed? Very innocent lie. Remember? He comes to Eve and God's told her, hey, eat of any tree that you want to. I'm just limiting you to the, well, that one tree that, which tree? Knowledge of good and evil. Can't eat that tree. All the other ones enjoy. What the devil say? Have you considered Eve? Hath God said? Oh, it's so restrictive. Look at all the trees you can enjoy. He's so unreasonable. One tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Hath he said you cannot partake? I mean, don't you just want to exercise your own freedom and enjoy it and get away from the heavy headed nature of God? I mean, he's so rule oriented. What'd she do? She ate. What'd man do? He ate. And ever since then, the devil's been proposing the same lie. The lie. What's the lie? You can fulfill your own desires. You don't need God. And your desires are a-okay. See, he still does this today. Remember when I did my transgender series? Were you, or you all knew? You know, when, I, when I went through that? I mean, I was really shocked when I went through it because they kept shifting genders on me. And I'm trying to write a dissertation and finish it so I can get oral exams. I got to turn this thing in. And I'm writing my dissertation and proof texting this and that. And they're at 20 genders. Then they're at 30 genders. and they're at 40 genders. I'm rewriting as I go along. Then they're at 50 genders. I, I quit at 70. 70 genders. I'm trying to wrap my mind around. What is that even? What were they doing? It's a lie. What's the lie? Hath God said there's only two restrictive genders? A male and a female? I mean, that's what I thought, but has, surely God will let you choose whatever you want to. See, that's the lie. God gives you over to the lie if you want to believe the lie, and that's what Paul says in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Those are sexual passions. Degrading passions. Our culture would say, if I reject God in his ways because I don't like his restrictions and I want to fulfill my own desires, be whatever they may in my own perversity, I'm not going to call them perverse. They're not degrading to me. What does Paul say? No, they're degrading. They're passions, but they're degrading. Because you can have a great passion or an evil passion. And Paul says, no, they're degrading passions. 
And he's going to give you some very pointed illustrations of what he means by degrading passions. Because here, what is he talking about? He's talking about false worship. He says, if you take God off the throne of your life, don't want him, you're going to put something else there. It's the ultimate exchange is idolatry. Because what is idolatry? Here's the definition. Idolatry is reducing God to a manageable form. I, God that I can get my mind around. He says, you're going to take God off the throne and put your God around your own perversions. Like what? What's he say? He says, for their women did what? Notice the key word here is going to be the word uh, exchange. And we need to, that verse. For their women, he's going to give an illustration of the ultimate trade. Like idolatry is the ultimate trade in worship of God. He's going to say there's a one-to-one correspondence. He says, sexually, what happens? It's unnatural to move away from God. He says, well, think about what the women do in the Roman culture. What do they do? He said, I studied your culture. The, the women have exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. What's our culture say? Uh, nothing wrong with that. I mean, they're just fulfilling their desires and they love each other and there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. What does Paul say? You're exchanging how God made you for that which is not how God made you. This is what he says. I mean, think about this. This is most important. If a woman is with a woman, can she fulfill the biblical mandate, God's mandate to all mankind, Genesis 128? He gave, after he made it, remember when Adam was lonely? You remember? And, and God said, hey, what's your problem? I'm lonely. You need a woman. What's that? Let me make one. And he makes her. And it's awesome when he makes her, isn't it? Yes. Women, you don't think it's awesome? I, I do. He <laughs> makes a woman. And, and she's like bone of his bones, flesh. She's perfect. I mean, he sees her and he's like, she, God made her. She's awesome. Now think about it. Genesis 128. God gave man and a woman one command. What was it? Be fruitful and multiply. How, how do you do that, Paul? You're a rabbinical scholar. Well, Paul's going to say it's unitive and it's generative. It's binary construction is unitive. I'm speaking at the 30,000 foot level. It's, you with me? Binary construction is unitive. And then it leads to generative. Be fruitful and multiply. So when a man and a woman get together, they fit together and they are under God's mandate, if it's within his will, to produce what? Children. Children. If a woman gets together with a woman, Paul says, that can't happen. Can it? Now, it can if you circumvent it with science and a whole bunch of other things. But in its base form, you cannot fulfill the mandate. So Paul says, in its base form, it's abnormal because that's not how God designed it. It's unnatural. This is what he talks about. He says the natural function. Natural function is a woman with a man. A woman with a man. Not a woman with a woman. Which leads to some interesting questions. I don't only have 30 minutes. I'm limited. Can a woman have love for another woman? Yeah. I mean, can a man have a man, love for another man? Absolutely. Can they have a relationship? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have them in my neighborhood. I, I talk to them. They know me. I know them, etc. They have relationships. Absolutely. Is it optimal? No. Not how God designed it. It's not the best that it could be. It's unnatural from how God designed it. This is what Paul says. Now, Paul here is speaking in terms that, now don't, don't like meander off in some other direction. This is super important. Okay, promise? He said they left a natural function of what it was designed for. Uh, this is, from my perspective, knowing Paul, in what city is Paul from? This is Bible trivia. Where was, where was he from? Tar Tarsus? Tarsus, you know, kind of like uh, north of Syria, over into Turkey, major metropolis, and it is an academic intelligentsia center of the day. It's like Athens of the Middle East. He's from there. Uh, the uh, philosopher who uh, schooled uh, Augustus Caesar lived there. The Stoic school of philosophy had headquarters there. You cannot tell me Paul didn't know Aristotelian thought because Aristotle had permeated all these schools. Aristotle looked around at the world in his day and he came up with what are called the four causes. Paul would have known this stuff because he's using Aristotle's kind of language. He says, when I think about a man and a woman, I'm thinking there's a form and there's a function, right? Unitive generative. Here are the, the four things of uh, causation of something being made, according to Aristotle. The difference between Aristotle and Paul is Aristotle is going to say the final formation of something has a purpose, but the purpose was not designed ultimately by God, and Paul's going to come along and say, no, I, it's God. So when something comes to, into being, there's a, what he would call as a, before it functions, it has a material cause. So let's think of a woman. She's got hair, right? Skin, 
flesh, blood, et cetera, respiratory system, circulatory system, et cetera. So does a man, right? That's the material that they're made out of. That leads to the next thing. God then put it into a form, a form. He made a woman and he made a man, a form, how it's constructed, which then leads to, well, how did it get into this form? Well, that leads to the efficient cause. Well, God made the special woman and God made the special man to be unitive and generative. That leads to their final purpose, which is what? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Or you mean to tell me that being, being in marriage, is, there's not pleasures involved in that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely there is. But what's the end game? What am I designed for? To fill the planet. That's what God called me to do. And that has to be in the relationship of marriage between a man and a woman and fulfilling God's desire. Anything less than that is not normal. It's against nature. That's why Paul says it's against nature. It's, it's against design. It's not how something's designed. Have you ever used a tool in the wrong way? Men, this is your opportunity to confess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what'd you do? Yeah, did, did you destroy the tool? Yeah, a metric tool on a standard socket. What happens? This thing's going to fit. I mean, one time, one time I was in my room in high school and my dad was not extremely um, gifted when it came to hands-on things with, you know, fixing stuff. I am, but he wasn't. It was totally funny. He couldn't fix things. And so I heard all this loud, he was putting in a lock in the kitchen out to the, out to the garage. I'm hearing hammering, sawing, filing, uh, him getting frustrated. So I finally walked down there, hey, dad, what's going on? I'm trying to get this lock in this door. And I'm like, uh, you're, what's the rasp for, the flat rasp? Well, I got to get it to fit. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And I said, did you read the directions? No. What do I need those for? Get back in your room. You're in high school. What do you know? And I go, well, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking round lock. You're making the hole bigger, but you're using a flat rasp. I'm kind of thinking that's not going to work. And then I've been reading the directions. Hey, Dad, do you realize you have that lock in backwards? You just need to get in your room. You know, He was going against the form and function of all the tools. You don't use flat rasp in a round hole. What happens? You know, until they sold that house, when I went to call it, that door never closed correctly. <laughs> and see, but people do this sexually. I'm going to take this and this and mix them together, and that's going to be good. No, it's not. It's not optimal. The door still worked, but it wasn't optimal. That's what Paul's saying. He says, if a woman gets together with a woman, it's against design, not optimal. And then he says, the men are the same way. What's he saying? Verse 27, the same way. Also, the men did what? They abandoned what? Natural function of a woman? And they burned in desire toward one another, which they shouldn't. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Because when you deviate from the natural, there's always a price to pay. And I can't give you all the prices you can pay. But when you deviate from that which is normal, there's guilt, there's loneliness, and a whole long list of things that come with it. But when you're a sinner of God's will, how he made you, well, then there's shalom. Then there's peace. See, this is what he says. Man with men... Doing that which is not, they're not supposed to do. Not optimal. Uh, Liz's dad's brother, Jack, uh, he died a few years ago. Great man. He was in the Korean War, U.S. Navy. Became a something altogether with the diplomatic corps. And eventually he moved to L.A. And he bought his own cleaning business in Beverly Hills. <laughs> a nice one. He cleaned Fred Astaire's home. His crew did. So he could sit with Fred Astaire and talk to him, imagine, while his crew's cleaning the house. And I'm like, you knew Fred Astaire? Uh-huh. But, but Jack always had a partner, and it wasn't female. And we just all knew that Uncle Jack, well, he's, he's not like the rest of the people in the family, if you get what I mean. He lived in uh, the Beverly Hills region, a uh, beautiful house, uh, uh, old, uh, uh, it was a, a mansion from the 30s. Um, awesome house with his partner, who was a retired film producer, had thousands of movies in their uh, theater room. Awesome. Do you think that when they invited us there uh, for Thanksgiving that we said, no, we're not coming? Because they invited us, and we'd come. Why? We love Jack. Do I agree with what Jack's doing? No. Do I want to say my children aren't going to sit at a table with Jack? No. My table are, friends are, kids are going to sit at a table with Jack because they love Jack, but my kids are going to ask me, hey, Dad, who's that man? Who's that other man? Well, that's his partner. What's that mean? etc. And I teach my children. But if I'm, if I'm ever going to get an opportunity to reach Jack, I have to love Jack. Where See where he is unconditionally. 
because he has these distorted, some prime, sinful view of relationships as God designed them. And Paul says, Jack, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. There's a better way. What's our culture say? Well, let them do whatever they want to do. Doesn't matter. No, it matters greatly. It matters greatly. How do people get around what God says here? Because I think it's pretty clear. Well, I'll tell you the crafty ways that they do it. I'll give you two main views. Number one, they will say, and here's the view, oh, Paul is just using his Jewish heritage, which is very restrictive, and he's laying it over the Roman culture, which was very free, and that was so inappropriate. That is not what he's doing. Uh, I know that to be the case, because number one, he talks about women and men leaving natural function. That terminology relates back to Genesis 1 of the Torah. He's not talking about Jewish heritage. He's talking about the Torah. He says they're leaving how God designed them. Number two, when he talks about men and women here, he doesn't use the normal terms for men and women. Uh, the normal term for a woman should have been gune. He calls her here a thulus. He, the man, he should have called the man an arson, but he calls him an anir. Why? Because in Genesis 1.27, when God says, I created a man and a woman, he used those very two obscure terms. Paul says, I'm not quoting Jewish heritage. I'm quoting from the Torah how God made a man and a woman. He made them to be unitive generative within the confines of marriage. Anything else is a deviation. Number two, Boswell, in his book, uh, Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality, argues uh, that Paul is not condemning loving relationships of same sex. He's condemning heterosexuals who are dabbling with heterosexuality, which is not how they're made. Sorry, that is not what Paul's talking about. Because nowhere in the entire Bible, because I have looked intently, does it ever say same sex is approved by God? Nowhere. Nowhere. It's condemned as not being what God says is optimal. And so the whole argument begins to fall apart. And then when you study the culture of the day, you begin to read the people of the day, uh, like uh, Cicero, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, because I've read them, they long before Paul condemned that activity in their own cultures. Paul just comes along and says, you're absolutely right. God didn't make it that way. There's a better way. What do you do if that is your propensity? That's your desire? And you're sitting here thinking for the first time maybe in your life, maybe that desire is not how God designed me, how it should be. Because we come with simple, simple packaging. It's taking that desire and saying, God, uh, I struggle with this, but help me. There's an old hymn, and I love the old hymn. It says, there's room at the cross for who? You. You. Because God takes you just as you come. And you say, God, here, here I am with the, all my desires that are twisted and off, and I lay all my sin down at your feet. He alone can help you to deal with those desires, to live in such a way that you find true peace and joy in all of your relationships. There's nothing better. And if you're a Christian, and you have a jack in your family, what should you be doing the next time they invite you for dinner? Should you be there? Think so. Why? Because you're telling them, hey, I love you anyway. You're important to me. But also looking for the opportunity to guide them to truth in a loving way. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to open some of the more difficult verses of the scripture. Hard to talk about, hard to read, uh, but so pertinent to our culture and many of our lives and many in our church. Uh, and we, we pray you'd give us wisdom and insight on how to minister, how to stand for truth, and how to do it in a way that uh, honors you and also leads people to the cross of Christ. We pray for those in our families who struggle in these areas. Might you be patient and gracious toward them to guide them toward that which is most pure and holy before you and help equip them to that end. Uh, and we pray all these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. God bless you.